I'll do some very quick introductions of uh, who we've got around the table with us. Um, so, Yelena Saporzhikova, uh, who is a, a senior independent director at uh, Interrao and other Russian companies, but is also the CEO and co-founder of the World Economic Forum Climate uh, Change Initiative uh, in Russia. Uh, we have Roger Munnings, um, who I think many, many of you know, but who's, uh, among other things, he's the chairman of the Russo-British Chamber of Commerce, but also an independent director, a member of the board of Sistema, Lukoil, and Norilsk Nickel. Irina Bakhtina, Chief Sustainability Officer from Rusal, uh, one of the world's largest uh, producers of low-carbon aluminium. Uh, we have Yuri Gavrilov, who's the Director for Strategy and M&A at Mittal Invest. Yuri, it's good to see you. Again, one of the largest global producers of HBI and other sort of iron ore products. And so one of the, the cleaner, more environmental inputs that keeps the steel industry going in the world. Uh, we have Sergei Bakulenko, who's the Director for Strategy and Innovation at Gazprom Neft, one of the largest oil and gas companies in Russia and also a major player in the global oil and gas, oil and gas markets. Uh, David McGlinchey, who's the Chief of External Affairs from Woodwell Climate, I think one of the top, if not the top, climate research institutes in the world. Uh, and also David's colleague Natalie, who's also from Woodwell Climate, who's, who's with us. Um, Julie Delanchon, who's a Climate Transition Risk Analyst at Wellington Management, so representing the big money at the table today. Uh, and uh, Paulina Leon, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer from Ross Atom, uh, and I guess one of the biggest uh, nuclear players in the world and, and doing very interesting things in this, in this, in this area. And uh, Rob Mullen, who's a co-founder and CEO of a business called When in Rome, which is actually an interesting wine business that has been pioneering this with the whole concept of boxed wine. And actually, I think you'll, you'll tell us a little bit about the journey, but uh, I guess you overcome a bit of skepticism, but actually has been making great traction in the UK and in Europe, and it's really been kind of making this work. Um, and anyway, so uh, with that, um, we'll, 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 we'll start our discussion. Uh, thanks again for everyone for being with us. And I guess I'll start maybe to my left uh, with Yelena, um, who again, you have a sort of broad view of Russian business and Russian industry. And so maybe you can start with just a couple of minutes of how you actually see the issues facing Russian business overall in terms of kind of getting to grips with climate change and what, what you see happening and what you see as some of the key challenges. So it's a, it's a hard task to deal with that in two minutes, but I know, I know you're up to the challenge. As usual. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone. Very glad to be here. And, you know, when you speak about Russia and you consider Russian, Russian environment in a, in a broader sense of this uh, word, you, you have to be mindful about several things. Uh, a is the fact that coming from the Soviet times and given the Russian mindset and mentality, uh, we are very late in, I mean Russians, we are very late in, <coughs> in reaction, usually we are quite late, late in, in reaction. In the climate change um, issue or, or uh, challenge, the main thing is that Russia in its um, business and its thinking is a bit behind the, the, the whole world and is more reacting rather than leading the process. And now they're trying, at least that's what they say, uh, trying to catch up with that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we are one of the largest, I would say, polluters in the world is not making it um, an, easy, an easy task. I think we are the fourth in, in the world. So the challenge is on the table, and I guess and I think that Russia would like to, to take a leading role in this process, but um, by its own rules. Speaking about business, uh, you see a huge shift in the mindset, and all of the representatives around this table, and I mean generally, um, ESG and climate change is. I mean, I think it's the topic at every board meeting, and we are all discussing it, and we are all including it in the agenda, in the um, annual reports, in our conversations with the investors. And like a year back, a, a year ago, um, the reaction was like, we do not really care about what would investors say about the capital markets. Let's see what what would happen. And this year, I see that when the investors starting voting by selling their shares, like for example in Interrail, um, the free float ESG funds just left the free float. So basically, 
um, Russian businesses, Russian companies are forced to think about it, even if they don't want to, because the capital markets is there and it's really developing and it's really demanding. And um, one more thing to that is that the regulators, the Russian regulators, are becoming more and more mindful about this, again, driven in, in the reaction mode, unfortunately, but still driven by the carbon tax um, EU is imposing. So there is a huge like uh, thinking process behind the scenes, given, given this fact. So this is a broader picture, mm -hmm. and I think we can start with this. Thank you very much. I think that maybe, Roger, not just because you're next to my left, but also because you have a, a fairly broad view of different companies and different industries, maybe I'll let you provide some opening remarks as well. Yeah, thank, thanks, Tom. Um, hello, everybody. Nice to be here with you all. Um, just picking up on some things that Elaine said, you know, uh, I think it was Bismarck who said, Russians saddle up slowly but ride quickly. And I think we're already into the right quickly phase, maybe at the start of it. But um, uh, and I also think because of Russia's geographic position, the fact that it's got 53 percent, I think, of the Arctic coastline, fifth of the countries in the Arctic. I think those big rivers, three of them, drain almost half of Russia's land. Some of it very agricultural and. Uh, you know, I think it's it's in a prime position to move to a leadership position, should it want to, in um, in environment issues and uh, and other ESG-based issues. If I look at the three companies whose boards I sit on, um, Norilsky will all know about, um, quite possibly only because it dumped 21,000 uh, tons of heavy fuel oil into the Arctic uh, water system. May. 2020, year, I think, yeah. yeah. Um, there's been a phenomenal transition of the company since then, probably heavily provoked by that, um, but my observation would be needed as well, um, because Norilsk is a very severe environment, um, a lot of environmental <laughs> degradation because of the mining. Um, but ESG uh, environment is now top of the agenda. The first item on the agenda of every board meeting, which we have. And it's about whether we've completely solved the problems caused by um, the diesel spill. And it was difficult. It's not like, uh, I hadn't appreciated this for a while, but it's not like you know, a tanker running aground in warm water where you can, you can scoop up the oil if it happens relatively quickly. This is very, very shallow, swamp-like area, and it's very difficult to clean up moved huge amounts of soil to restore it, um, moved huge amounts of water to clean it, um, and it's being heavily monitored, as you'd expect, by uh, Rospirodnaz or the, the Russian um, government organization, by uh, academics, uh, as well as obviously. But I think it provoked a, a big, big change in attitude, um, not even a subtle one. In, within the organisation, within the board, and uh, obviously within the executive management. So I think um, if you look at its website, you will be staggered by um, the amount of information that's given, the very clear and transparent uh, points it sets out for progress um, towards a much better company on ESG areas. Um, let me move quickly to Lucor if I've got time. Lucor being an oil company is just struggling with what its future is going to be at the strategic level, as you can imagine. It knows there's going to be a lot less hydrocarbons, probably a huge lot less hydrocarbons consumed in the future. Um, and it's building its scenarios around three levels of move away from hydrocarbons. At the same time, we understand very clearly that we're only going to succeed as a hydrocarbon producer unless we make it continuously cleaner and continuously more efficient in terms of natural resources. And then at the same time, it's looking for areas to help it with carbon neutrality, to help it with sustainable energy. So that's uh, Lucor. Moving to Systema, not obviously uh, a, a company which plays in this field, but it does have um, Segasia patent pop business, which I think now is you know, probably in the top four in the world, maybe top one or two in Russia. Um, and it's working very, very hard on its efficiency, its cleanness, 
and most importantly on the restitution of, of its cut so that uh, it's not diminishing forests but in fact increasing it. The Russian companies are on the case, I think the Russian government certainly on the case as Lynn has said. We're all doing a lot, we all, we all need to do a lot more um, to push harder, to keep nudging each other uh, and I do see an opportunity for how do I put this, for Russia to kind of re-emerge, if you like, to, or Russia to play its place in the world in this area because of its location. Yeah, no, I think so. It's, it, it, it's clear that more needs to be done and we, we will get on to sort of what those practical steps might be. And, I, and I, later in the discussion, I'll be coming to David and, from Woodwell Climate who've just actually put out a report addressing some of these issues of why sometimes the words don't always uh, translate into actions. And so we'll be looking at that, but we'll come to that in a bit. Paulina, maybe I can come over to you actually. So, with you know, from Russ Atom's perspective, now, you know, there's been a lot of discussion of nuclear in COP26, and I think that, at least in my understanding, I think there's no way that the world can achieve some of its targets without nuclear becoming a, a much more significant source of energy. Equally, there are always questions. You know, you hear the word nuclear, and you, you know, everyone starts to sort of freak out, and there, you know, and, and so on. It's got a, there are sort of, you know, a reputational sort of associations around it. So, how are you seeing it from an industry perspective of, you know, what what is going to be the role of nuclear going forward? Yeah, um, actually, Rosalem has um, has to chair so to sit on because uh, first of all, we of course uh, is a company, and uh, but we also have a status of uh, some kind of state ministry, so we are quite deeply involved in all this regulation and drafting in Russia. And we, as we are international company, we also um, have a lot of uh, conversation discussions about our uh, regulation in regard to in regard to climate impact um, and uh, and other requirements that are uh, all over the world. So uh, it's, um, uh, frankly speaking, it's a really quite challenging issue to uh, to make uh, nuclear uh, recognized as a proper proper source of uh, low carbon energy. So uh, to to just to be included uh, at the at the same play, uh, at the same strategies uh, for low carbon de um, development as other low carbon sources. Uh, the, uh, the the idea is that uh, no one denies actually that uh, nuclear is low carbon uh, because uh, in regard of some some uh, resources, so uh, it, it is uh, it has uh, lower carbon footprint uh, than uh, other renewables, or at least the same for the uh, whole life cycle. So that's really very important. And nuclear uh, it provides resilient energy base load, so it's also very important in regard of. A uh, huge amount of electricity uh, is needed for uh, developed countries all over the world. Uh, but uh, the question is uh, to, to fit this criteria, do no significant harm. So, um, actually, for the last, I think, for the last two years, when uh, the war developed the European taxonomy, uh, the whole International Worldwide Nuclear Society was focused to to prove this uh, this request for guaranteeing of do no significant harm, uh, and that is much broader issue than on the climate impact I would say because uh, it covers also uh, these uh, easy questions uh, that is not on the for environment of course it's there there are a lot of questions uh, in regard of. Uh, uh, efficiency of nuclear uh, nuclear energy and uh, specifically of uh, nuclear waste treatment uh, in regard of its environmental impact. Um, but also there are a lot of a lot of uh, questions and fears, I would say, um, about uh, its social impacts it's, uh, in regard of human health. But uh, recently we have this uh, very nice, uh, I think. 40, 400 pages of uh, Joint Research Center uh, of uh, uh, European uh, Commission report. Uh, so there was a huge report for half a year uh, of European uh, European experts, uh, which says that nuclear uh, do no uh, harm more than other uh, source of electricity, which are recognized, which are already recognized to be sustainable. But uh, the is, uh, the question is uh, when we be will, when will be uh, officially recognized because you know uh, everyone know there is a cat in the room <laughs> but <laughs> no one has seen it uh, so um, so that is uh, that is uh, you know the regulation is a very important part of the uh, of uh, 
uh, driving the uh, low carbon strategies all over the world because uh, problem a lot of a lot of people a lot of countries they are thinking about the proper way of uh, of uh, providing uh, this uh, low carbon base load but they think they think that we really need to uh, to have a permission from the point of regulation and uh, uh, actually we need to be uh, th this regulation to be clear and not controversial in between uh, other different regi regions uh, regions uh, sorry so the question is uh, uh, now for nuclear, that so uh, in, in case of that is decision of one country, that's on their own. In case of that that is decision on developing or not developing nuclear uh, for the region, for example, the European uh, Union, that inputs a lot uh, all over the world. Uh, that's the question of for the region. So yeah. it's it's much 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 more challenging. Yeah, and I think that that whole area of sort of regulation and sort of avoiding contradictions between regulatory frameworks in different countries is a big topic and maybe one that we'll come back to a little bit later on in our discussion. I think perhaps if we stay in the energy sector, uh, maybe I'll come to Sergei uh, to kind of give a view. So again, we are more in the oil and gas uh, sort of uh, space here. So maybe you can talk us through how you're seeing the issues and then perhaps we'll shift over into the mining, metals and mining space. Right. Uh, of course, oil industry has been watching the whole decarbonization agenda rather closely for probably a decade and it has been a subject of discussions for example and World Economic Forum oil and gas caucus for quite a few years. So yes, uh, in Russia the whole issue emerged probably in the last year but it hasn't come as a surprise to us at all. We've been discussing it with our oil and gas colleagues Gazprom Neft, for example, has a very close partnership on many levels with Shell. I myself personally come from Shell originally, so uh, we have been aware of it. Of course, we share the same problems, issues, challenges as the rest of the industry. Uh, people love to hate oil and gas. And for many people, uh, decarbonization equals to uh, uh, elimination of oil and gas and they just love and can't wait to see this to happen. The irony is that if you read Net Zero 50 report, A, it says that we still need oil and gas, perhaps a quarter of oil, a half of gas, or what we're using today by 2050. And the second element is there's going to be a gentle glide towards that goal. And by the way, Net Zero 50 is an aspirational goal and most likely uh, by 2050 we were somewhat short of it and if you look at those trends there will still be a lot of oil and gas needed and if we stop investing here and now I can assure you that production decline will be much steeper than demand decline according to those aspirational reports. So, on one hand, uh, people assume that oil and gas should start to decline. On the other hand, people assume that oil and gas is taken for granted, that it will be there when it's needed. And as events of this fall has been showing, that's not always the case. And sometimes if uh, the forces of nature do not perform, well, we're suddenly short of gas um, to cover for the shortfall. So the situation is that on one hand indeed we have to think about our long-term future uh, for the time when indeed there would be less demand. On the other hand we have to look at how we will be covering the demand that is here and this is a challenge. For Gazprom Neft it is less of a challenge because uh, we are sitting on rather lucrative uh, production base, probably more lucrative than what uh, our Western colleagues have. Well, of course, less lucrative than our Gulf colleagues have. <laughs> um, and this production base means that our energy spent on producing those hydrocarbons is lower than many other places, shale oil, for example, or our sense. So in that sense our scope 1 and scope 2 footprint is lower than in many other places. 
at least we can produce hydrocarbons and we think uh, the world will need with a lower impact than in many other places. That's issue number one. Issue number two, again, we read the net zero 50 and it says the world will need a lot of carbon capture and storage. Right. And what are the companies that are best mm -hmm. positioned to do CCS? It's oil and gas because it's our skills mm -hmm. to find uh, underground traps for gas, it's our skills to drill wells, it's our skill to pump the gas. So uh, we actually see our future as also a CCS operator, but for that we need properly functioning um, C2 markets. Mm -hmm. And with that, as industry, we need to tackle quite a few misconceptions that both the public and politicians have. If you ask general public out there in the street, uh, if they point out to the main source of CO2, they would probably point at the exhaust pipe of a car. Well, that's not true. Coal power stations is a source. If you convert coal power stations to gas, natural gas, you would save as much CO2 emissions as the whole road transport in the world emits. And that's, of course, a much easier proposition. And I'm not even talking about switching from coal to nuclear, for example. Uh, if we look at how much does it cost to capture CO2 from atmosphere and pump it into the ground, that's probably $250, $300 per ton. If you look at how much European governments pay to their citizens for avoidance of CO2 emissions <coughs> when they buy electric car and such, it starts from 400 euros and sometimes reach to 1,000 euros per ton. So if you think at what's the most efficient way of spending resources and efforts on decarbonization, and we have to bear in mind that there are other development goals that unfortunately because of these misconceptions that's not the effort best spent. And part of the effort the industry has to make is to tell the public how things are. Unfortunately, and I have to finish where I started, people A, love to hate the industry, B, love to see it go, and C, do not believe us. So there's, a, there's a, among other things, an image issue that I guess needs to be tackled here uh, to sort of complete the conversation. Idina, maybe I can come to you if we sort of shift more into the kind of mining space. So again, you're with Roussel, which is again one of the world's largest producers of sort of low carbon aluminium. How are you, how are you seeing the big challenge facing your industry? Well, first of all, I mean, to address to what Sergei just mentioned, the issue of perceptions is critically important, you know, the way how the uh, broader society looks at our uh, industries, mining industries, metallurgy industries. Aluminium has, as we believe, a bright future and it has a role to play in a new sustainable uh, economy. It's um, hugely on demand for uh, building new renewable energy infrastructure for electromobile industry, for new construction, for design of comfort, uh, living kind of community environment, etc. In architecture and design, I mean, uh, it's also in huge demand. I mean, low carbon aluminium in a sustainable packaging sector. So we see it is on demand. But meanwhile, we face. Uh, some really key challenges which we need to address uh, as soon as better. First of all, its technologies. If we talk about primary aluminium as is, we probably sorted out the scope to issue for us because we produce it with the hydro energy. So our scope to uh, portion of carbon footprint is like 2%. And uh, unlike many other players in the world. Because again, hydro energy powered plants emit seven times less CO2 than coal powered ones. And we keep repeating it just to remind. That's actually what allowed us to, uh, along with other climate actions which we've already implemented, uh, launch the Allow brand, which has uh, the lowest probably carbon footprint uh, globally. Uh, because of the very, very low scope two and really low scope one uh, levels. 
uh, which is 2.2 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of metal versus the benchmark is 4, but average across the world is 12.5. So we are five times less probably, uh, less uh, as the product. But to go further, uh, beyond this low-hanging fruit is getting more difficult. As uh, who was this? Christiana Fugueres, the lady who actually was helpful in drafting the Paris Agreement. The other day I visited her lecture, listened to her, she said, look, first half is always easier, first half of the journey, than the second half. So the second half for us is technology. For us to be able to actually completely bring scope 2 to 0, or almost 0, is to commercialize inert unknown technologies which is nothing new for aluminum industry, everybody knows about that, but this is a breakthrough innovative thing, which is yet to be commercialized. It's like, you know, pilots and projects, and you've probably seen this aluminum pavilion built next to Amadillo building in the COP26 space, uh, which is made out of this metal, but this metal is not for something else, you know, it still has its kind of, you know, composition which is not commercial, you know, commercially uh, viable for the sectors which we normally supply to. So this technology is capital intense, it needs a lot of money and it needs a lot of time, which in terms of time, we don't have. I mean, we need to speed it up. And what we see in Russia, we have to cope with this task alone as a company. What we see in the western part of the world, governments do, do play their role. Canadian government, Quebec province governments, they co-invest into the startup along with a couple of big major aluminum players, really kind of trying to boost and accelerate and speed up the development of this technology. That's on primary side. On secondary side, what we see from our customers, like the Ball Corporation, which is one of the biggest United States uh, uh, aluminum packaging or aluminum cans kind of producers, they were speaking at our event the other day in the Russian pavilion at COP26. Uh, they are actually very, very keen to work with recycled material. And they are currently waking up in the United States to the idea that in Europe for many years there is already a deposit scheme to kind of pay the customer or pay consumer for a piece of packaging when they get it back. And sometimes it gets you like two weeks only when you just take your soft drink from a shelf, uh, drink it or consume it and then put it into a proper recycling bin. In two weeks time you have this metal recycled in a, in, in a bin or in a can, sorry, in packaging can on the shelf already, so the best ideal scenario. Obviously, we don't have this infrastructure. United States are just starting doing something like this. In Russia, we are near, I mean, nowhere near close to the even regulation which would help uh, manufacturers and packaging producers to, to, to get by this idea, but we are trying to pilot something around such infrastructure which would help us to start picking some of the secondary material. So these are a couple of challenges which um, uh, I would like to cover, but again, bringing back to fro from what I began with is perception. We definitely, as a business, listening to all these critics, you've read all the Twitter pipeline these days, business is being blamed for everything. And again, Christina Figueres in her speech was making a very fair point, tone of voice with which we speak to each other, with our critics. It's nothing helpful if we are excluded. We still have to do all these transitions. Capital intense, really difficult. Trying to change engine on a flight, you know, when the plane is in the air. So we definitely need to be included and listened to. Thank you. I think some <clears throat> very valuable points there. And, and actually, in, in the introduction, we talked about this sort of concept of leadership and which countries might be in a position to actually play leading roles in it, which companies might be. But I'd like to remind everyone here that we need someone to play a leading role in taking some food uh, <laughs> so that everyone else can, uh, can feel comfortable following in. Um, uh, while you're doing that, Yuri, maybe I can come to you again. You have one of the sort of the interesting sort of clean inputs into into the steel process. Maybe you can talk to us about your industry. Yeah, no, thank it may you be all. unfair to come to you as I offered food, but uh, <laughs> I, I will watch. There will be time. Yeah. I will watch and uh, talk, but uh, indeed, uh, 
this uh, decarbonization is not you know, something that uh, new. Obviously, this is a very uh, sustainable uh, international trend which we you know, can observe for you know, already you know, many you know, years. And uh, after the you know, first, it became more and more you know, important uh, in you know, our lives, in our you know, production as a part of uh, overall ESG you know, agenda. And uh, you know, Metal Invest is. Um, one of the leading uh, uh, vertically integrated uh, mining and metallurgical uh, companies. So uh, they actually produce uh, the whole range of uh, iron ore products starting from iron ore concentrated up to the final high quality uh, steel. So uh, we know the process uh, from A to Z uh, very uh, well. But uh, what is uh, important for us, it's not a question uh, to do it or not to do it. It's a question how to uh, do it. Because uh, many uh, companies like uh, ours, we already undertook uh, long-term goals of uh, how to become neutral in terms of uh, carbon or greenhouse emissions. And uh, indeed, uh, formally speaking, uh, this year, Metal Invest uh, developed and approved a uh, long-term strategy consisting of several phases, stages of uh, how to uh, move uh, forward to, uh, towards our uh, long-term goal to become uh, carbon neutral by 2050. Okay. And, uh, uh, but uh, for us, uh, it's not something uh, absolutely new what we have uh, developed. We uh, based our uh, projections, our uh, projects uh, already on uh, our ongoing uh, operation. And uh, you correctly mentioned that uh, we are the largest uh, uh, merchant HPI you know, producer, which is a fabricated iron. Uh, this is a uh, very advanced uh, technology. Uh, we also uh, use um, uh, so-called uh, direct reduced uh, iron to produce uh, steel. And uh, this is also advanced uh, technology, uh, and uh, you know, we operate uh, you know, very unique uh, uh, metallurgical plant based on such uh, technology. And uh, you know, we do have the lowest uh, footprint uh, in our uh, steel at the level of uh, 1.3 ton per, uh, per uh, liquid uh, steel. Uh, for the reference, uh, the average for the industry is 1.8. And uh, conventional uh, technology, which is uh, widely used uh, so far uh, to produce uh, steel, above uh, two uh, tons of uh, CO2 per uh, ton of liquid uh, steel. So we are already quite uh, advanced. And uh, starting from this uh, position, uh, we are uh, thinking how to move uh, forward, uh, what we can uh, do uh, better. And uh, here uh, we developing our strategy uh, already uh, defined uh, very uh, specific uh, uh, projects and plans uh, uh, to make it very uh, uh, short uh, by 2005 uh, because uh, from this point uh, in time it's uh, relatively easy to talk about 2050 or 2060 uh, uh, how we are going to become uh, natural but uh, we want to uh, show uh, how we will uh, achieve this uh, goal uh, step by step. And by 25, we already uh, put a very specific uh, task for us to decrease uh, our low uh, level of uh, CO2 emissions uh, even uh, further by another 7%. Uh, percent. And it's uh, easy always uh, to, uh, to measure. And uh, I fully agree that uh, this uh, first uh, na, na phase is relatively easy because we know what to do. Mm -hmm. We know how to improve our ongoing uh, na operation with efficiency, with uh, na better na practices, uh, na better technologies, uh, na, but uh, na how we are going to uh, na decrease our CO2 emissions by uh, 2035 uh, by 77%, uh, na, na, this is uh, na, the na re really big uh, na task. At the moment, uh, na, the na conventional uh, na process to produce steel uh, is based on blast uh, na furnaces. This is uh, na coal, coal uh, na agglomeration, a very dirty uh, na process, a lot of pollution, a lot of uh, na CO2 emissions. Uh, na. So uh, we need to uh, eliminate this uh, na, na, na area na, from, uh, na, from the process, to replace it uh, with electric uh, na furnaces to replace it with uh, na, na scrap. This is uh, a recycling uh, na process. Yeah. Yeah. 
The problem for the industry, not for, not for us, is that uh, using only scrap, uh, it's impossible to produce high quality uh, steel. The normal conventional steel is uh, not possible, but not uh, not high quality, which is really in demand, which is required for all this uh, process to support it, because uh, we uh, still need uh, new processes, we need uh, new equipment with new requirements for materials, uh, etc. So uh, this is uh, an issue. And here, uh, our uh, product, which uh, I mentioned, uh, hot briquette iron, is uh, crucial because uh, with such a uh, product, adding it uh, to the scrap, uh, putting into uh, electric arc furnaces, uh, it's impossible to uh, dramatically decrease CO2 emissions during the process and also uh, to produce uh, uh, high quality steel. So this is uh, another area where uh, we are uh, working. And obviously, uh, uh, hydrogen. Uh, we already have uh, uh, practice uh, and uh, in our processes we use uh, great uh, hydrogen even now uh, in the production of uh, uh, HBI or uh, DRI uh, we are using uh, natural gas as, uh, uh, as uh, immediate uh, to reduce uh, iron uh, in the process and during this process due to the high uh, temperature uh, uh, methane uh, cracks uh, with, uh, with uh, not, not hydrogen. Here, uh, not, not, I fully agree that CC in the US uh, not technology is absolutely uh, not crucial. But it's not only technology, because uh, uh, we are talking about a uh, uh, very large uh, uh, scale uh, industrial production. So uh, the volumes are uh, very uh, big. So, uh, we need uh, to put it to uh, store it for uh, longer uh, time, and uh, uh, this is uh, another issue. So uh, all these uh, real practical uh, uh, issues should be uh, addressed uh, at the uh, technical level, and of course uh, we need to find uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, benefit uh, some, uh, somehow, because many such uh, technologies which are uh, uh, available actually, uh, and uh, uh, we can use them at the pilot level, but uh, not at uh, the industrial level uh, yet. But uh, they are all uh, expensive. It uh, requires a lot of uh, investment uh, to confirm uh, at the industrial level, to prove uh, the technology, to uh, find uh, a scale uh, to decrease uh, the cost of such uh, technologies. So all these uh, issues uh, should be uh, addressed. And uh, to support uh, our uh, uh, discussion in the uh, beginning, uh, I uh, fully agree that uh, Russia can take uh, uh, a leading uh, role in such a uh, process because uh, we do have very good uh, uh, base. I'm, I'm talking not uh, only about natural base, but also uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, people, uh, uh, skills, uh, 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 practice. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, again, Coming back to uh, hydrogen, uh, we all understand uh, at the practical level that uh, using only renewable uh, sources, it's impossible to produce such volumes of uh, hydrogen which would be required. And we know the numbers of uh, flower uh, production, it's uh, unbelievable. So uh, we have to consider various options and uh, we fully support uh, low carbon uh, uh, electricity produced by our nuclear uh, power plants, and we are working in this uh, direction. For us, uh, it's not a question uh, uh, what to do, it's a question how we uh, do it. We have uh, very specific uh, goals, and uh, uh, we're sure that uh, we will achieve it. Uh, and again, Russia has infrastructure and uh, uh, all, uh, all pieces uh, in place. I agree, sometimes uh, we uh, probably considered uh, quite conservatively uh, various uh, issues, but uh, when we uh, make up the mind, we cannot uh, move very uh, fast. And uh, for in terms of our discussion, I think uh, we have uh, all uh, everything uh, on uh, on the table to be uh, successful. Yuri, thank you very much indeed, and you've hit on some big issues that we'll be kind of coming on to, uh, and you said you've got everything on the table to be successful, you've also got everything on the table in front of you now, so <laughs> bon, bon appétit.
Um, I'd like to make a, a, a big jump actually into a, into a different industry, into, into, the, into the, in the wine industry. So Rob founded a, a, a very interesting business that's doing great stuff with, with boxed wine. I should apologize first that uh, I couldn't find the Pouligny Montrachet in a box uh, today, so I'm sorry it came out of a bottle, but uh, we'll do better next time. Um, talk, talk to us about your industry. Yeah, so I mean, like, I, the, the wine industry has a, an image problem that's opposite to, to most of yours, you know. The, 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 the wine industry is seen as, uh, as a, it has a great image, um, and, 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 it, and in fact, uh, it's not necessarily the case. Um, I mean, the wine industry is in fairly, well, not, not a unique position, but it's like a lot of food producers, it is similar to, it is right at the forefront of the, the issues caused by climate change, but it is not an insignificant emitter of, uh, of CO2. I mean, it's uh, the global emissions of the wine industry are something like 20% of aviation, which is low, but it's not as low as you know you would expect it to be. I mean, it's, I mean everybody would agree that aviation is part of the problem. Um, and when you think the wine industry is producing 20% of the aviation industry, it suddenly becomes a more significant um, polluter. It's also right, you know, unlike many of your industries, it is right at the forefront of climate change. So, you know, if you look at the summer, wildfires in Greece, wildfires in France, in California, um, it's, it's making the wine industry, uh, with it, they lost, many producers lost their entire crop. Um, Hailstorms in northern Italy, which is unusual, that, that destroyed the, the crops there too. So, as wine, um, the demand for wine in the world continues to increase because more and more consumers, you know, as they, the more and more middle class people in the world, they find a taste for wine. Russia would be the perfect example of that. It's a very fast growing market for, for the wine industry. Um, there is a there is a supply issue, but the, the the problem my industry has actually, and I'm speaking with my own book because. Like I run a sustainable wine business, so there is no pressure on our industry at all to improve its its game. Um, and when you consider the amount of emissions that it does produce, like I think there should be. Um, for example, if, you know, as Tom mentioned, that my wine comes only in boxes. Um, I'm absolutely loving this Amarone, which comes in a bottle. It can't be put in a box. The Italian government will not allow that to happen. So, like, I feel guilt-free in drinking this. <laughs> um, but 39% of the wine industry's emissions globally come from single-use glass bottles, right? So, I'm not saying we eliminate those, um, but, you know, you can imagine if you dealt with that issue, um, of all FMCG goods, wine is by far the most overpackaged. You know, you don't buy muesli in a supermarket in a glass jar. Uh, you don't buy Coke anymore in a glass bottle, uh, but you do buy wine in a glass bottle. And there is really, in 90% of the occasions that you're buying it, there's absolutely no reason to do that, right? Um, the solutions that we're proposing as a business are, you know, the wine boxes, as Tom mentioned, also aluminium cans. So one of the first things people say to you about glass is, like, oh, well, it's recyclable, you know? and it is, but it requires a huge amount of energy to recycle it. That's assuming that it, it is recycled. Now, and even in the UK, well, of course, there's no. I mean, in Russia, I'm sure there is not for glass recycling. In the UK, there is. We're a long way behind the rest of Europe, by the way. Um, but I think about 40% of glass bottles are recycled in the UK, which is much lower than people think. You know, you would expect something like 80 to 90% to be recycled. It's not the case. So, um, you know, we're we're an industry that, uh, in a sense, you know, we're damaging ourselves because we are doing nothing to address the climate challenge. I mean, very, very little. Um, but we're going to suffer the effects of it. Um, I speak specifically about my Italian producers because we're in, we're in the southern, southern Europe. It's getting hotter. It's getting less and less. It's getting more and more challenging to produce wine there. Um, and a lot of the solutions are staring us right in the face. Um, so, yeah, the packaging is one. And then, of course, with agriculture, I mean, this will have, we'll have this in common with every other agricultural producer. But there's many things you could do to, to produce the wine in a more sustainable way, right? Italy, for example, makes very poor use of solar power. Um, most of my wineries don't have don't have solar energy; they just take mains energy. So yeah, we, we have the opposite challenge to, to you guys, really. Like I, my industry should be put under pressure for, for to, to change, and and isn't being you know, and, and it's it's left to actors like myself, and I'm definitely the smallest company at the table here, you know, um, to to try to change that. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure you will. 
Um, so, uh, Julie, maybe I can come to you. So, Julie from Wellington Management, so you're looking at this more from a finance investment angle, so maybe you can talk us through how, you, how you're thinking about these issues. Sure. I'll speak a few uh, minutes about the challenges for us evaluating all of uh, the transition strategies that have been uh, laid out at the table, and I think uh, a couple of things. First, that the evolution of transparency from companies, you know, is is still in process. So understanding both just where do you stand today, but then as you are moving to great ambitions, how are all of your uh, all of your people being incentivized? How are you thinking about uh, capital allocation? How is this influencing long-term strategy? All of that is not standardized at all for investors to be uh, comparing companies across regions and even within regions. The other question I, that I think this it's partly related is a bit of a perception challenge for um, from investors is climate is the first it's a, it's a great forecast, and yet, and investors, their whole job is to try to predict the future. And yet, without da good data to back test what we are expecting to happen, right, and to really test our models on, it's quite difficult for investors to make that change uh, in mentality, that the future isn't going to look like the past, and so my investment process needs to evolve. So that is an internal challenge we're working on to say the companies that are forward looking are going to be the winners and that's what we need to lean into as an investment company on behalf of our clients. And then lastly, I'll just say that I think it's again and related to all of those issues is the time horizon question. You all talked about how this is going to take time and yet you and I um, are evaluated on a quarterly or maybe at best annual basis. Mm -hmm. And so how do you message that to, uh, you know, to the investment community, but also our clients ask the same of us, um, is if we're underperforming because we see a longer term trend, how do we convince them that that's still going to win in three and five years, if not in one year? Um, so those are a couple of the things I think challenges we share, um, but hopefully we can we can also tackle. I, I, the time horizon question I think is a it's a great question. So yesterday when I was in a taxi, um, and I, I find that taxi drivers are phenomenal sources of information because they're, they're, they know everything. They can manage states, you know, probably United Nations. Precisely, precisely. They're mostly philosophers, uh, so they're, they're, they're creative. And, but they also, I think they have their sort of, you know, finger on the pulse because of people who they're talking to. And so he was, I asked him, I said, how's, how's, it, how's COP going? And he said, I don't think it's going very well at all. They're talking about these 2050 targets. And he said, who cares about 2050? If, if you're talking about then, you're not talking about now, and you, you'll come up with a reason not to do it by, t by the time you get to 2050. So I think that is, it, it is an interesting sort of question, and it's a philosophical one, but also a very real, practical one as well. Um, David, let me come to you, and, and so uh, from uh, Woodwell Climate, uh, and I know, I know you've actually just come out with a report that talks around some of these issues. Your, your observations on what's been said so far and, uh, and, and how you think we should take it forward. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, and I will just take a moment to kind of reflect on this conversation because the Woodwell Climate Research Center has been studying this issue both from a scientific perspective and a policy perspective for 36 years now. Um, and as recently as five years ago, a conversation like this would be a third rail. Um, that nobody would want to be a part of. Uh, climate change was a, you know, we'll talk about it behind the scenes, but don't, don't let anyone know that our company is, you know, really publicly engaging on climate. Um, and that has changed, I mean, as evidenced by this launch, by this conversation, that's changed so dramatically. Um, it's now the kind of virtuous uh, issue to be involved with, which, if, any, if anything, makes me incredibly optimistic that we are heading in the right direction and all kind of pulling in the right direction. So I'm so happy about that. Uh, I, I will take a step back, though, to, to kind of um, think about how we're all assessing climate change. Because I hear a lot of ambition around the table, um, but one of the premises of the report you mentioned, Tom, that we released this morning with the British government, uh, was that even people who think they understand climate risk don't actually understand the scope and scale and severity of what we're facing. Um, you know, 1.5 degrees maybe can be adapted to. 
2.2 degrees becomes very unpleasant. Um, with our current nationally determined contributions, we're headed northwards of three degrees, which at that point becomes, I mean, borderline cataclysmic. You have massive migration, you have social unrest, um, you have economic disruption that would be very difficult to, to accommodate. Um, so the one project we're working on is trying to, trying to figure out ways to communicate the true severity of the risk um, to political leaders, but also to business leaders. Um, because in many cases, when your supply chain is international, your exposure is actually much more significant than a single country's um, you know, geographically constrained exposure. Uh, Russia specific, one area of research that we do a lot of work on is permafrost thaw, um, which has global implications because of the enormous amount of carbon that is stored uh, in permafrost thaw, twice as much carbon in permafrost right now than is actually in the atmosphere. Is that right? Okay. Um, I knew it was a roughly right. Um, uh, and, and as it thaws, it emits in various forms, methane, um, carbon dioxide, occasionally nitrous oxide. But um, uh, that, that's a huge global implication. But for the Arctic countries that, that have permafrost, I mean, the, the potential for kind of damage to infrastructure, destabilization, is really enormous. I mean, the, the very ground underneath many cities, many pipelines, many roads will buckle, will, you know, slump will just um, you know completely completely become unreliable um, and I think it's so important uh, for the business community for the political community to to take the time to understand the true severity of the risk because then I think you start to have conversations like you said where 2050 starts to sound a little silly um, you know if, if we're really talking about the ground falling out under cities then we start talking about 2030 because that's a much more appropriate time frame yeah and I come, come over to you since the, the mining industry was raised, raised by Neil, and so, you know, A, there's a question of whether you could be one of the enablers, you know, equally, as Neil said, the sort of the message isn't cutting through, and, you know, whether it's people don't want to hear it, aren't hearing it, so maybe one could debate that. But so I wonder if you, A, have a comment on that particular issue, but also p potentially thinking about it in terms of are there practical things that you are planning to do or could be doing that you think might help with that issue that uh, you know, is outlined? So first of all, Edina, and then over to you. Well, I would probably switch our focus a little bit to regulation, which is obviously needed to help business in this really kind of uh, challenging and difficult uh, times of transition. Do you remember this saying, I would wish nobody to live in times of transition, but that's all my life, in the business last 20 years is about, you know, just witnessing and participating in this transition. So regulators are supposed to completely rethink and reimagine the kind of landscape in which we operate. And uh, it's no secret that the regulation in Russia specifically is uh, very, very raw in a very beginning, you know, of the development processes. Just like you big says, we've got the strategy of uh, low carbon development for the social um, and the I mean, social economic strategy for low carbon development until 2050 with a longer term view of net zero by 2060, which itself still provides a lot of uh, space now for very initial discussions on what it means for every sector. And we also hear very uh, different points of view. Should it be developed on a sector by sector basis? Or should we take into consideration the whole value chains which we are part of? And by the way, this approach is making the process is super complex because as I already mentioned, aluminium is part of value chain for FMCG, for fast moving consumers, for aviation, for uh, electromobile uh, construction, for construction, for building construction of bridges or whatever, infrastructure, etc. etc. So uh, having all sorts of these discussions cutting through horizontally or vertically, and they need some measures from the government already to help those pioneers who everyone in, in, in their sector already take leading steps, already have this burden, you know, to re-engineer our businesses. Uh, we need to be positively discriminated. Uh, like, for example, in, as early as 2013, Europe has adopted this resource-efficient manifesto, which, for example, very clearly stated 
that two thirds or 60% of public procurement should go green. And this is a very positive signal to the market because the government is a, you know, a huge player on this procurement kind of market. And uh, in Russia, the situation is completely different. The discriminator factor is price. So we, with the money which government or you know, budget revenue is spent on different needs, we actually kind of, the, the, the country funds whoever you know, you know, but not definitely the green companies or companies who did invest a lot already into transition, uh, which needs to be addressed. So many of these things. And carbon pricing, not an exception. The other day we had this discussion also at a net zero day in Russia, led by M Plus, which we belong to. And again, the expert community says if every country has a carbon pricing system more or less compatible with each other, we don't need all this carbon tax adjustments, you know, through the borders. Uh, currently we have like, probably, I'm wrong with the numbers, around 69, 70 different systems which make the carbon price different from 1 to 239 kind of euros or dollars equivalent, you know. Very, very different, very difficult to com compare. So regulation, that's something which we definitely are focusing on already and will need to focus on the nearest future. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, um, Yuri, can I ask you to add to that? <coughs> uh, from um, uh, the Apple Manic uh, industry point of view, I will just uh, give you a couple of uh, examples uh, just to illustrate uh, the scale uh, that we are talking about. At the moment, um, more than 50% of uh, all steel uh, is produced in China. And this is uh, more than a billion tons of uh, steel, just in one uh, country. And uh, obviously, uh, talking about legislation and regulations, uh, in one area, we should uh, remember that uh, there are very big uh, players. And uh, again, uh, the metal uh, the industry uh, actually is responsible for approximately 50% of uh, the CO2 emissions, uh, which is uh, quite a substantial uh, contribution. So uh, uh, we can be pioneers, we can uh, invest, because uh, again, we are talking about quite a uh, big uh, real investment to change uh, from uh, these uh, no, conventional, traditional technologies to uh, something uh, better, more uh, cleaner, more greener. But uh, no, if we will do it long, then uh, no, we are uh, just not uh, compatible. Not, uh, no, not uh, no, no, be able to no, no, actually compete with, uh, no, again, uh, no Chinese uh, no suppliers. And this is a uh, reality. And again, we undertake, uh, uh, undertake um, to uh, decrease our uh, greenhouse uh, emissions. Uh, uh, we take into consideration CBAM regulations. Uh, uh, we know how to uh, calculate uh, each uh, ton of uh, carbon uh, emissions uh, with uh, our uh, footprint. But uh, at the same time, we know that indeed in uh, China, uh, they will uh, increase uh, by uh, 20, 30, uh, at least uh, the uh, level of uh, their greenhouse uh, emission. This is also uh, a reality. So uh, we, uh, <coughs> we have to think uh, obviously uh, locally, and uh, we have to uh, move, uh, we have to shift uh, this uh, the situation as a part of overall uh, change uh, in the perception, mentality, uh, to make sure that uh, we would achieve such a uh, goal. At least 50% uh, uh, of our uh, all products uh, go, go to uh, international uh, markets. So uh, without uh, regulations, without uh, this uh, support, uh, I think it will be just uh, unfair for uh, certain uh, uh, areas because uh, we can invest, but uh, it doesn't really give us uh, any uh, benefit. Uh, so uh, it also uh, should be uh, considered. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Um Palina, perhaps I can come back to you, actually, uh, in terms of what you've been doing at Rosat, and I think 
you've already done a lot in your sort of journey moving towards some of the kind of goals that we've been outlining here, but I know you've got a lot more that's st still ahead. So perhaps you can outline some of the practical steps and things that you're thinking about that what, what, you, what will you be doing next? Um, yeah, the, the first question for us now, the most urgent question I would say is uh, to, take, uh, to take our um, net zero obligations as a company, as an industry itself. But we do not want just to announce it loudly and uh, and then sit back and think, okay, we have some time until <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, I'm uh, I'm against this. Uh, so uh, the the challenge for us is now, right now, this year, and uh, probably we will uh, succeed. I hope we will succeed uh, with this uh, for the next year. Uh, to understand what is our uh, scope one, scope two, and scope, uh, scope three footprint, carbon footprint, in regard of the whole industry, the whole reserve. As uh, actually, we do have, uh, we do have not only our nuclear, we do have all, also, for example, wind farms. We have all our composites, uh, composites um, uh, production. We have nuclear medicine, a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, so we want to calculate our uh, our uh, general footprint and to understand if it is really possible to achieve net zero. If you do understand what to do right now, so we do not want to be uh, to to be just loud, to be just in public with all this uh, all this announcement. We want to do something. We want to understand what is the better way for contribution uh, for, from our company to the to the content of the world itself. Because um, and, uh, one more thing we want uh, we want to understand uh, how to make it um, from a business point, how to make it uh, investment uh, efficient. Because uh, I think that everyone in this room uh, who who is related to the business sector, to the uh, commercial companies. We really do not have much money for that. Uh, in uh, in case we uh, we uh, do not lose or do not gain some revenue, some extra e revenue, uh, that is uh, of course that is question about the market itself. If we have uh, if we would have any room to provide our our um, products without this uh, this uh, net zero commitments. But uh, anyway, the question, the, there's a really very big question how to make this uh, net zero carbon, uh, carbon investment efficient. So that is the, I, I, would, I would say that's really a challenge for them right now. And um, even we have our uh, basic product, we have very low uh, carbon emissions, we have very low basic mm -hmm. carbon footprint. We still are very much taking a challenge with this uh, net zero uh, necessity. So that's the thing. Thank you very much indeed. And Sergey, I know you wanted to add a comment on this. Uh, right, indeed. I was going to say that we have to be very open about this, that energy transition and decarbonization are going to be a very costly undertaking. And it's absolutely unrealistic to think that existing energy industry companies would be able to foot the bill or metal companies or any other companies for that sake. So this has got to be a shared burden. And again, unfortunately, sometimes politicians sell the whole concept of energy transition to the populace with the idea that uh, there would be very little cost to them, that net zero future is a situation where almost free power from <coughs> wind and sun and no and so on and that's not the case and indeed when whoever comes up with expectations and demands that oil companies energy companies metal companies should do more to reduce their carbon footprint we've got to be at understanding that there will be a dripping through all this cost into the final prices but we've seen that this year haven't we? we've seen the cost mm -hmm. coming through for the first time. <coughs> For the first stage, yes. uh, and it's been a shock to people yeah. when they see their gas bill going through the roof. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But I would volunteer, though. I think that's absolutely right. I think it's incredibly important to be upfront with people about the true cost of the transition. But I don't think that number exists in a vacuum. Uh, I think the cost of not taking action 
and are also incredibly significant. Thank you. Um, and so understanding you know, the future adaptation costs that will be incurred without um, decarbonizing in some way has to be understood. You know, but, yeah, but but, politicians but, peddling it as mm -hmm. an easy, pain-free transition. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's the yeah. issue, isn't it? Yeah, no the forest right. stands up here and says, you know, it's all quite straightforward. I mean, yeah, but it's, you know, President Biden said it would be profitable. Uh, the European Union is peddling the argument that it's profitable. And it's, it's exactly the wrong argument. First, because you bring it into the area of free enterprise, and that's divisive and com competitive. You need to look at a different way of doing business, as we talked about. Uh, and, and secondly, because it's just plain wrong. Um, and, you know, it's outside the area of free enterprise. It's an overarching umbrella by which businesses must act, I think. Uh, the whole area of environment is not something you can take down to a business profitability level. Yelena, I know you wanted to add as yeah, well. I wanted just to reflect briefly on what was said. Um, actually, we are making a bridge here, and Sergei, thank you very much for that. Because the very um, important element to the whole of this discussion, I think, is sustainability. Because um, in looking into results of energy transition, we should not forget about the sustainability of the current businesses and the cost the end user will be, the end customer will be paying. Now what we are seeing is that there are certain costs that businesses should incur and the burden of that cost is actually with the end customer and just normal people, SME businesses are actually paying for that. And you were absolutely right in pointing out that uh, this cost has to be shared. It's very easy to say that in a theoretical discussion around this table, eating nice lunch, thank you Tom for that, but it's very, very hard to achieve. And one more thing I wanted to say just very briefly is, you know, coming from the venture capital background, uh, you know, we have this um, term, uh, death valley, for, for the startups. And those who pass their death valley, they become, if not unicorns, but still very, very, very uh, successful companies. And we see examples of the companies who are now in, in the front end of this journey in terms of the energy transition, especially in Scandinavia, we see a lot of companies already showing very good um, results and revenues and EBITDA uh, after they, they, they've made the energy transition and they become ESG compliant. So generally speaking, I believe that there's a very um, difficult but very important breach we have to, 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 to pass, but um, I'm afraid there is no way back, so we're all in the same boat. We are indeed. Um, Rob, why don't you give us a quick review back, back, back to the wine? Um, we haven't spoken about wine for some time. Uh, so, you know, what's next? And, 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 and actually, one, one of the themes that has come up really has been about sort of consumer and what the consumer is like actually demanding what they're willing to pay for. Uh, you know, because you know, who, who picks up the check for some of these things that are happening? And I, and I guess that's definitely something that is affecting what you're going to be doing next. Well, it, it, it is. I mean, actually, uh, I guess what my own company is peddling is a low carbon solution that's actually cheaper for the end consumer, right? Um, certainly in terms of packaging. Um, because glass bottles are very expensive to produce and to move around, um, but people don't care about that. This is this is the, so you know. I, literally, I, I think you guys should start pointing the finger at the wine industry uh, next time. You, you know, the, I mean, um, yeah. I, I would, I guess, yeah. For us, it's, it's how how do we attract attention to the fact that you know, although our emissions might not be significant compared to other industries, they still are significant. How do we attract attention to that fact, and how do we how do we change that? Um, the um, the sorts of things I would like to see happen would be like carbon labelling. Um, if we, we actually like we actually become the first wine brand in the world to do that, so we, we label the carbon impact of our products. Uh, it's not an expensive thing to do. Um, I mean, the, the, the end cost of the consumer is. How do you verify that? So we use a, a Scandinavian company um, called Carbon Cloud, uh, which um, so there's a. A Swedish company called Oatly, which is an oat milk producer, uh, probably the largest in the world now, actually, and they were the first to put the carbon footprint on their products. So if you buy an Oatly pack, certainly in the UK and in the Netherlands and Sweden, 
has the carbon footprint produced by uh, whether the the value they use is grams per kilo product. Okay, no, so. A London yeah. metal exchange has already come up with a digital passport for metals, which again, yeah. it's all substantiated with papers, with documents, with verification. Mm -hmm. We've got like two Austria verification for our carbon footprint, which is a yeah. very happy to kind of attach to this sort of uh, traceability system. I would actually be fascinated to sh have your opinion on the, the study that we've had done of our wine and aluminium cans for example, mm -hmm. because we, we sell wine in boxes and aluminium cans. Right. And the it's a very interesting one because in terms of the absolute footprint of the container, uh, a can produces more CO2 than a box. On the other hand, it's much less wastage because it's a small, it's a 250 mil serving. It's very like, light, compaction rate is like 12 to 1. Exactly, and it's yeah. infinitely recyclable and more or less. But yeah. this, would definitely, this would definitely help consumers to judge us better, you know. And they yes. can positively discriminate because this glass story which you told, nobody really appreciates. Nobody knows. And then the other thing is, so for example, we did a study in the UK, but um, you know, even our wine, that's imp so when we started to do the study of the carbon impact of our wines, those made in northern Italy, of course, have a lower impact than those made in the south, because we take our wine from northern Italy into the UK by train, but within oh, Italy there's no domestic, yes. there is domestic rail freight, but it's mostly by truck. Yeah. So it increases the carbon footprint. but. If you're consuming Sicilian wine locally in the UK, it's still half the carbon footprint of, of locally produced milk, for example. So one of the things we're saying is if you want to reduce your carbon footprint, you know, put, what, put wine on your cornflakes <laughs> instead of milk, you know. <laughs> Don't we all <laughs> want any to <laughs> You won't be doing it with just me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so we, so we have those solutions. Part of the exercise. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to launch a, a can wine brand in Russia. I mean, uh, let's do that, actually. Um, but yeah, we, so we have solutions, but we don't, there isn't a demand for those solutions. We need to create one. And so, if not a carbon tax on consumer goods, because that would be politically very, very difficult, like carbon labeling yes. in the same way that you label uh, for calories or whatever, I think that's very achievable. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I actually, you know, I had to, I had to change my flights back to Moscow yesterday. I actually, for the first time, I noticed as I just stuck something in Google and, and already saw a couple of sort of flight options, and I saw a carbon label on it, yeah. which I've never, which I've actually yeah. never seen before. So I don't know if it was, yeah. it was in honor of COP26, and then we'll all forget. Swiss but. trains or Swiss rail is doing it for quite some time. Like, what's the option? You can do it better than your flight. It's the plane yeah. you just take. I, I of course should should it's not confess to thinking about planes. I, I should be taking the train back to Moscow, but um, sometimes <laughs> the practicalities don't always work. But, um, but it's also like, the I think when you take the train from, say, London to Paris, yeah. like the okay. Eurostar, it emits yeah. much less emissions in France than it does in the UK because wow. the nuclear industry, because the, the energy mix is more nuclear in France, suddenly oh, really? the emissions, yeah, the emissions per kilometre goes down like by four or something. It's like a huge multiple as soon as you cross into France. Really? Because really? the same energy is produced in a different way. It's a nuclear, it's all nuclear yeah, in France. 80%, right? Yeah. That's really very, very interesting. Uh, in France, it's uh, more than 70% of nuclear energy. Right. Uh, and that's uh, yeah. really uh, for my own um, uh, consumer behavior. That's really very impressive uh, that when you see that, that's, uh, that's like a menu, you see these uh, calories. Yeah. When you when you when you uh, need to keep your diary, so you see the uh, okay. I take this one. When we talk about the companies, the large business conscious obligations, conscious, conscious commitments, it's it's the same. That's about uh, twenty fifty. That's that's somewhere. Uh, and when that is and they took at your ticket at the uh, the box. And, uh, yeah. and the menu that is uh, that's about you. Yeah, and that's, about, uh, that's about your choice. That's really really works. No, I no absolutely because I think you know if you don't have that, it's I think it's very difficult to think that actually consumers will drive much of this because it's not, if it's not really being sort of rammed down your throat yeah. all of the time, yeah. it's very easy to, to just not think about that. Yeah. Uh, but if it, if it really is sort of visible at every decision making, you know, sort of uh, the purchase process, then that can change things. Yeah. Yeah. We have about 10 minutes or so before we're going to try and wrap up and, I, and one of the topics was looking at where there is potentially scope and or need for sort of better international cooperation to be able to see some of these issues becoming more of a reality. And so maybe I'll, I'll start with Roger, perhaps with, with your wearing your hat as chairman of the Russo-British Chamber of Commerce, and then if any others have any quick comments around international cooperation, we'll be happy to take those, but perhaps you can kick that off, Roger. Well, that's a big topic, and, and I guess COP26 is all about that, but I think, um, I think it's inarguable 
that the whole approach needs an umbrella of agreement by world leaders everywhere. Um, I think if we look at the UK Russia position, which um, I know more about, I mean, I think the standoff that resulted is a um, yeah, that came as a result of a horrific affair in Salisbury uh, was exactly the wrong approach. Um, you know, government leaders should have been talking to government leaders saying, what the heck happened here? This is unacceptable. You know, however it happens. Uh, and I guess we still don't know. But, but, um, but silence and non-engagement is exactly the wrong approach because it, uh, it leaves open huge scope for accident, um, and whatever, and I think leaders constantly, government leaders constantly have to talk to each other, they have to talk to each other, and I'm sure they do when they're talking, but they have to be open, transparent, and they have to be absolutely straight. So I think that's the first thing, Tom. I think, um, you know, I think different countries build up different expertises because of their differing natures, and I think many, many, um, many, many companies in all countries um, have the opportunity to get engaged in this whole approach and should be welcomed by other countries. I mean, I think if we look again at the Russia-UK position, despite all the political issues, um, certainly the Russian government, and we, we spoke to the president about it, uh, and I speak regularly to the British ambassador, to the ambassador, in, the Russian ambassador in the UK about it, fully supportive of British business, fully supportive, and in fact encouraging for British businesses uh, in Russia, we're delighted in that. Vice versa, we speak to the Foreign Office regularly, and although they're less willing to be vociferous, they are supportive of any doubt at all. Otherwise, you know, the Russian British Chamber of Commerce might, 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 might exist, <laughs> but because uh, you know, don't want to go against the world's you know, government. So, so there's full government support on it. I would like to see more vociferous support from both uh, support from both sides. It's not because it doesn't exist in Russia, because as I said, it, it does, but I'd like there to, it to be more overt. Uh, and in the UK, I think there's some hurdles that have to be gotten over um, so that uh, the relevant government departments say, yes, please go ahead, please work together. This is very, very, well, all areas of business are important, but this is very, very important, so we like to see it. I was asked a question about sanctions yesterday, um, uh, because Neural Scathing had some some of the things it wanted to buy to sort out some of its issues, I think relating to the sulfur capture um, project, which I, which, I, which I didn't mention um, earlier, were, were sanctioned so it couldn't use them, it seems crazy to me. Something that stops 1.9 million tonnes of sulfur going into the air every year and you can't use it because it's sanctioned, seems to be a very, 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 very short-sighted um, decision. Yeah. But, so. So I think you know we have to get over the others. I've never been a fan of sanctions myself. I just I don't think they work. Um, I think people are making a political point, which is far better made in the way that I made it earlier, which is leader to leader saying what the heck's happening. What's happening here. So I think I'd, I'd, I'd just I'd just say that we we're, there are many British companies working in Russia at the moment, as you know. Um, not as many as there are German uh, or indeed French. Um, but we, we'd like many, many more, and we'll do everything we can to encourage it. But I would like a clearer umbrella. You know, business will happen without government support, but it's always much more comfortable when it knows there's an umbrella of uh, talking mutual respect in those discussions. Um, you, know, you don't have to like your counterpart, but you have to respect them. You have to know you're all headed in the same direction. So I would like to see. Uh, uh, that umbrella much more firmly established and in fact I think Boris Johnson spoke to President Putin last week and I think he made the, I haven't read the transcript but I, but I think he made the point that although we disagree significantly in some areas we can cooperate effectively in others I hope that attitude pervades no, and I, and I do think on that sort of international cooperation point, I, you know, I think, sadly, when I think about Russia and the West, they're destined to disagree on many more issues than they'll ever agree on. But I think that possibly climate might be emerging as one of those issues where everyone can kind of come to the table. Because I think if we can't agree on that, then the rest of the stuff we're disagreeing on <laughs> may not really matter. <laughs> but, um, you, uh, Berlina, what, maybe I can come to you and, and send me a signal, anyone else who'd like to follow up on this international cooperation point. 
Uh, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, the idea of uh, cooperation is uh, quite familiar for them. It's uh, really we, we deal, uh, we do our business in more than 50 countries all, all over the world, so it's vital to cooperate. And uh, in regard of this climate issue, actually, uh, I'm in only for two years already for this uh, climate, uh, cl climate and uh, sustainability uh, agenda, and. Uh, uh, to my opinion, it's um, it's. Uh, I totally agree with you that uh, there is no use and there is no room for uh, for discussing who is greener or who is more sustainable this this time. Uh, and uh, there are no borders uh, because when you think about the, your uh, your country economy, you can think, okay, I do this and that. And when you think about climate, there are no borders actually because uh, you do you you do your uh, homework in your country but there is the, the whole planet and that's uh, that's what we are facing in for example in arctic region because they are uh, we we are, uh, we are nominated by the russian government to develop the northern sea route and to to care about all the all the low low carbon footprint in the region for the logistics issues and um so we understand that uh, that is of course this is a question of uh, the arctic countries uh, but not only them, because the Arctic uh, ecosystem is extremely fragile. We, we do understand that when we think about doing business in Arctic, we are thinking we are responsible for the whole world. Uh, so uh, I do absolutely agree that so that is uh, the question of the global diplomacy. It's time to be polite, because, um, for example, not, not uh, all countries understand what to do with that. Uh, at least we we uh, already um, agreed that it, that there is a problem, and for Russian Federation, for example, it was quite a uh, quite a difficult way to to go uh, and to accept this and net zero commitments. So uh, it it took for for uh, I think that it took one year only since uh, that was issued a year ago. It was issued a special decree of uh, the Russian president with. Uh, Quite a controversial uh, commitments about uh, carbon footprint in uh, 2015. It was uh, even growing in uh, in general. Yeah, uh, and certain sectors. Yeah. Yes, and, and it was highly criticized. It was uh, it was really very much questionable. And uh, that uh, the way we have uh, we have passed through this one year only, just for this public uh, commitment at the level of the country, I think that is uh, that is really good uh, good result. That is, uh, that is thanks to this, uh, let's say global pressure, but that is a positive global pressure because we understand that as a country we need to be in this dialogue and we need to contribute. Uh, and uh, I really very like, I adore this, uh, this sustainability agenda because uh, that is, I think that uh, I spent uh, even uh, the, the best two years in my professional career because uh, everyone wants to talk with you. Everyone wants to share with you some insights, some best practice, some some. Uh, every, everyone asks questions, so uh, that's really very nice, uh, very nice and open dialogue. So yes, I think we're we're on the way. <laughs> Fantastic, Irina. I think you wanted to weigh in. So let's just remember that climate is a global issue. So it cannot be kind of tackled on an individual kind of country or company or even sector level. It's a global level which is needed for sure. And uh, let's remember also that this is international organizations like expert community who is playing a huge role. For example, it is a forecast by International Energy Agency about 1.5 degree scenario and other side scenarios, which we all take as a basis for our sectoral uh, industry associations, etc., etc., to put together our plans and our pathways, how we, what we do about it. By the way, as a side comment, when I was in the presentation of IAA, uh, uh, Inter Energy Agency, the other day at the COP, they were talking a lot about electrification, which reminded me about the formula of communism, if you're aware of one. Uh, Vladimir Lenin was saying that communism is socialism plus electrification of the entire country. So it was exactly in this context where, you know, the whole discussion was so electrification will play differently a huge role and by 2040 they plan to have all the electricity from grid to be completely net zero and uh, by 2050 70 percent coming from solar wind and renewables 
which is amazing. So international organizations having all this huge expertise really help us. And another example is our aluminium stewardship initiative, which is, by the way, based in Australia, but brings from Australia, you know, because of all our inputs from across the world, such a rigorous discipline of these industrial standards. Honestly, being 13 years in the whole uh, kind of area of sustainability, it's first time ever I've seen such a rigorous approach to the standard setting, to the training processes, to the planning and all of that stuff. So I'm really amazed. So definitely international cooperation has a role to play. Fantastic. Yelena, I know you wanted to add a comment. Yeah, I wanted just, you know, to reflect on the word electrification. Because, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, yeah, what I want to say, it's not um, exactly about the international uh, cooperation, but it's about the thing that, like in certain regions of Russia or mm -hmm. in Canada or in the, in the states, like in Alaska, for example, it's just impossible, just physically impossible, to change something in the elect electricity infrastructure as it stands now uh, without really causing uh, tremendous damage to the um, environment in terms of the people living there. So, as we say, it's easier not to live there than to change something. So you either have to uh, keep people away from those regions or leave um, the infrastructure as it is because it would be just very cost, from, from, from the cost effectiveness, it would be just impossible to do that. So the uh, solution to that is to, uh, to be mindful about the fact that exactly climate is for everyone and it's everywhere. So we have, in order to achieve net zero, we have to be more effective in other regions because even by 2050, by 2060, there still be regions where it will be not really kind of environment, environmentally friendly and we will have to leave it as it is because when it's minus 50 and there are no winds and there are no other infrastructure like in uh, 100 no miles, sun, actually. and there is no months. sun, exactly, yeah. like so it's better, it's better to leave it as Two it hours is of now, light, exactly, light. but and we will have to be more effective. <laughs> 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 Didn't notice yet, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a trend. There is it's a virtual background. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, but we, we will have to be more effective in other regions in order to achieve that net zero. I, I think that... Uh, <clears throat> International cooperation is uh, uh, inevitable, and uh, without uh, such uh, uh, open dialogue, uh, it would be just impossible to uh, resolve all of the issues during uh, the transition. And uh, the transition already started, whether we like it or not, but uh, it's already uh, the process uh, which is uh, on going for everybody. Each uh, region, each uh, country has a different uh, position, different uh, starting uh, level, and different opinions, and different uh, views. That's why such uh, discussions and uh, cooperation is absolutely required. Otherwise, we uh, just uh, won't be able to achieve it. Now we have uh, one uh, climate, one uh, global, but uh, our planet became all of a sudden very, very small. And uh, now while talking uh, about such uh, issues, we, we have to remember that, uh, uh, yes, from one hand, indeed, uh, 2050 is uh, far away and uh, it's probably uh, too far on the horizon from now. But uh, from the other hand, when we take decision now or talk about such uh, issues, uh, we, uh, we are talking about uh, our plant, our home, and uh, our uh, children. Fantastic. Second, do you have a quick view on this? Right. In my opinion, as I was saying, CCS is one of the elements that will be required. And for CCS to work, we probably need a global market for carbon credits. And that's a very important element that we need to achieve, or at least a convertibility of carbon credits from various markets. And I know that there is a very heated argument going on in COP26 about various uh, sub-points of Article 6, which are very pertinent to this, and I understand there are actually certain design elements, for example, for European carbon market, why 
Europe is very hesitant to allow carbon credits from other places, which I think is plain wrong. I think that it's time for the politics and the policies to become uh, technologically agnostic, yeah. color blind, and judge various uh, decarbonization efforts on their proper decarbonization merits, not on the technologies used. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, Julie, do you have a deal? Yeah, I, I have been following the, the carbon markets piece and I think, um, I guess I'm slightly more pessimistic about the, um, the global nature of that, but I think one, if I, if I start with just us expecting the same thing globally on disclosure would be one, one place to start because the regulators are all moving in this direction and yet don't want to quote each other as they develop these it's standards. It's just happening, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Hasn't IFRS just absorbed IR? I mean, it's beginning Yes, to except no, no the US yeah. is not likely to join that effort. Well, so, they have got, um, you know, so. So, so understanding, even if there's understanding of where there's overlap yeah. and where they make distinctions, I, I think that, that would go a long way. Yeah, um, right. and, and for organizations that, that do operate in, in multiple geographies, it seems like a lot of time and resources spent trying to understand that landscape and what different investor groups are, are really looking for. So that would be my, my okay. request. Thank you. <laughs> Two final quick comments, one from Natalie and then, and then to Rob. Sure, I'm, I'm Natalie, I'm Dave's colleague, and um, one of my expertise is actually in the Arctic and Arctic scientists I've done my work in the Alaskan Arctic. And another report that we finished this spring was on global initiatives in the Arctic, uh, focusing on the um, security concerns and how, like with permafrost thaw and uh, sea ice melt, there will be opening of the Arctic Ocean and, and how there needs to be cooperation to handle these new opportunities so there's not tension. And it's not just the Arctic countries, but there are other countries like China and South Korea who are interested in these opportunities. And if we don't work now to acknowledge that and create some sort of coalition or initiative, then there'll be issues later on. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And so we'll, we'll give the last word to the wine industry, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is there hope? There is hope. There is definitely hope. Um, and if there isn't hope, there's wine, so it's... <laughs> it's <laughs> wow, wine for the road. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Your yeah, your make your last one, one yeah. a good one, you know. Uh, no, there is hope, and uh, the wine industry, it's, pretty low, it's a low-margin industry, very low-margin, actually. It's a low-margin industry, it will respond very quickly to financial incentives or, or disincentives, right? So, you know, a kind of carbon tax-based solution for wine and other FMCG goods will have very, very rapid... Uh, effects on the wine industry. I mean, it, obviously, I've, I'm peddling the, the, the packaging solutions, which are, are, are readily available, but also a lot of the agricultural techniques um, that, that are used by our wine producers. Uh, it, it's not it's not expensive to change what they're doing. It can happen very very quickly, but they need an incentive to do it, and they need a certainty to do that. And and you know, international cooperation on some kind of carbon taxation uh, based on the emissions of, of, of you know per per product would help. Our producers have this, and myself have the kind of financial certainty that they were making an investment made made sense. So, yeah, we again we can't do it alone. I mean, um, wine is you know, arguably world trade is the basis of world trade, right? The history of wine is the history of world trade, and uh, so international cooperation on the, on the conditions that uh, apply to it are is absolutely essential. Fantastic. Thank you, Boris. Now, we're, we're, we're at 2, uh, two o'clock, and just um, by way of uh, summary, I mean, one of the concerns I had when I, when I arrived yesterday is I was thinking that if there was one way to make the world less fearful of uh, global warming, it'd sort of make them go to Glasgow for two weeks. But I'm, I'm pleased to see that the sun's coming out to remind us that this is really an issue, and so we do need to be focused on it. So, but thank you very much to all of you. I think there's been a, a lot of great ideas and thoughts here. Clearly, the, the challenge, most of the challenge is still very much ahead, but uh, as, uh, as we said in this discussion, hopefully this can help us in some ways go from words to action. So thank you, everyone, and um, if not before, we'll see you in Sharm el-Sheikh at uh, COP27. That's, uh, <laughs>